that Osenerga wants to congratulate all future entrepreneurs for accepting the challenge. The global shift of clean technologies of tomorrow are creating business opportunities today. Here at Tele we promote sustainable innovations and more than half of the energy produced at Letovas Energia comes from renewable sources. Contrarian Ventures Smart Energy Fund powered by Ali and Accelerator is here to support your innovation journey. We are here to help you execute your ideas in the clean tech track as well as others. We wish you patience, determination and good luck. Hello, future entrepreneurs. Hi. We're at the remote channel from Lithuania, and we wish you good luck in shaping our future with your great ideas. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Looking for great ideas from you. Good luck. I uh, wish you best of luck in generating your new ideas, and looking forward to see the change. Hey social entrepreneurs, welcome to the team. Are you ready to be creative and come up with the new social innovations? If so, I want you to explore, fail and start over again. Yet never forget, everything what you create is going to change lives not only one or two people, but many. Good luck. And yet one more thing. If you can tell which country I'm sending this message from, I'm going to give you a prize. Thanks. Startup experience, growing people, improvement, knowledge, ideas, teamwork, motivation, fulfillment. Applauses, ladies and gentlemen. It was such a great intro of future entrepreneurs in such a great sunny day. It's usually sun means, you know, shining bright means a good future for your business. If you start business, sunny day, they say you must be very lucky. So you are the ones who are very lucky to be here today. Futurepreneurs pre-acceleration program was launched in 2013, as you might know, and became the first sustain sustainability pre-acceleration program in Lithuania. Program has around 200 motivated persons, 20 plus partners and sponsors, around 30 mentors. You know, much the acceleration programs such as Startup Highway haven't had so many mentors and it's been run for four years beforehand. So, at the end of uh, the program, there was 21 team and and they have received seven awards right you know that uh, the most acceleration programs in silicon valley have hundreds of startups and only like fraction three to seven percent have been funded annually so and you're going to hear it later on from the marvin that is you know it's a huge success in silicon valley so this year, Futurepreneurs ex expanded and now is at our great neighbor, Poland. So, ladies and gentlemen, one more time, I would like you to applause for uh, this lounge of entrepreneurs and the sponsors who are the Lietuvos Energia. You have seen your great applauses. The Western Union, one of the oldest financial <laughs> company, and the bank, one of the biggest bank local, Luminor. <laughs> and one more award I'm going to give today is the welcome speech of the youngest Minister of Economy of Lithuania. Uh, who as well is a very pro startup, said by 2020, we're going to have 1,000 
startups made because, as you know, only 350 startups have been made. I was personally as well involved in making them um, through the last six years. So, ladies and gentlemen, give your warm applause to the Minister of Economy, Virginia Sikavichus. Come on. The Minister. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my privilege, actually, to be here among uh, people who are aimed to change the future. And uh, I'm extremely happy to be here. As it was mentioned, it's, of course, uh, startups among the key priorities for the Ministry of Economy. And I'm extremely happy that the startup community in Lithuania, they are not only busy with, uh, you know, building up their startups, but they also are happy to help us out, to give a great advice for a government, how to build a best facility for Lithuania to help the startups. And we are looking forward, you know, to be a number one in hosting startups here. I really like the intro movies. Uh, what they really said, one thing, and I would like you to remember, because I just yesterday returned from Israel, and uh, you know Israel is, is probably number one in the world in creating startups. One thing they said very clearly, in our community, we're not afraid to fail. There are startups who start with one idea and they're already thinking about the other idea. I want you also not to be afraid to fail, but build those ideas which one day are going to change the world. Uh, nobody knew about the autonomous cars uh, 10 years ago. In Israel, they started a startup. Now it's worth $15 billion. And we are one of the countries which accepted the law on autonomous cars. We are one of the countries who wants actually to be uh, the country where autonomous cars can be tested. So Lithuania is a brave country, and I can see here uh, a lot of great, bright people, young people. I'm extremely happy that this is happening here. And most important probably for me to mention, I'm always happy to see that magical triangle when the uh, university is involved, when the businesses are involved, and when the government are involved. Then I think we can cook the best and, you know, give a, to a world a really changing idea. So I wish you to think broad, to think outside the Lithuanian borders and change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for uh, such inspiring speech. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I uh, uh, very welcome uh, the Minister to lead uh, actually the uh, uh, startup movement, which uh, gained momentum in 20, uh, 2011. Uh, and I wish a lot of luck because uh, luck is needed. Uh, and um, uh, coming from that standpoint, I remember, we, we just remember with Marvin Lau, who is uh, at the moment venture partner at the uh, Venture Fund 500 Startups, it's, as most of you know, one of uh, the most known uh, acceleration and funding, early stage funding product at the Silicon Valley. So the Marvin runs, uh, runs the office in San Francisco. I've personally been there. And you know, he, the Marvin uh, I've met in the Ministry of Economy, by the way, six years ago, then I was a part of management team in uh, Enterprise Lithuania. And I want to say this was the one of the very first moment uh, then we open up our eyes at the tech startup. So, uh, speaking from that standpoint, I want to uh, ask Marvin to join us uh, on the stage and tell about uh, his ideas uh, on the startups. Marvin, are you here? Here. <laughs> Great. Well, that's where you come up and tell us about Seed Stage Startup. All right. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, and good morning, um, and thank you for coming. I'm really, really honored to come back here to Vilnius. I was here three years ago um, speaking at the startup um, Silicon Valley Visits the Baltics, and of course, that was like almost like five or six years ago when I first came to Vilnius, and so this is actually one of my favorite regions. I hope to spend more time out here. And so, um, do you have my presentation? All right, great. 
Um, so what I, I was asked to speak about, I, yes, I, I come from the startup world, but what I was act actually asked to speak about, because I was told the audience is mainly startupers as well as um, young students, um, you know, one of, the, one of the great privileges I have is being able to travel the world, speak to, at a lot of places, and also just invest in a lot of companies. And my job, just this is who I am, it looks like I'm singing, I'm actually speaking at a conference. Um, you know, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Marvin. Uh, I'm actually a partner at 500 Startups, which is an early stage venture capital fund. But I've actually lived in San Francisco, Silicon Valley now for close to 19 years. And so I actually started off at a startup, as an early employee as a startup that raised about $30 million. Um, it was a disaster, actually died after a couple years. Uh, I actually ended up speaking, um, actually ended up uh, working at a, at a little known um, internet portal called Yahoo for about 10 and a half years. Um, and after I left Yahoo, I actually spent a couple years just traveling, which is one of the places I came here. Um, and I just did angel investing boards, advisory boards, and also have, um, and then I ended up joining uh, 500 Startups, uh, which is, and I run the Accelerator program. Tell you a little bit about 500 Startups. Um, we invest in seed stage startups all across the globe, mainly software with some hardware components. And just to give you a general idea, just our program, you know, we invest through the Accelerator program as well as the Seed Fund. Um, we're ranked one of the top three accelerator programs worldwide. And, and like I said, to give you an idea of just how challenging it is to get in, we get about 3,500 applications, and we only take about 30 to 40 spots. Uh, so it's very, very, very competitive to get in. And one of my jobs is to think about the future. Um, and one of the things I want to talk about is really the future of work, which is something that affects all of us, right? We spend so much time working, you know, whether it's startups or working, and, you know, and the world has changed a lot. And so let, let me jump into this. Um, and so one of the things I notice is that, you know, you're seeing a big, big change in the environment right now, where you, if you look at a lot of the corporates in S&P 500, over, you know, 40, 50 years ago, the average company on the S&P 500 lasted about 40 to 50 years. And you've seen that actually de decline, the lifespan of actually companies have dropped now, on average is about 15 to 20 years now. So you're seeing a lot of companies disappear. Why is that happening? Why is that happening? It's because you're seeing a lot of change in the economy, driven, I think, by technology, driven by global uh, com um, competition. And one of the things I saw as well, too, is that you know, because these massive changes are actually happening, it's very, very hard for these big companies to keep up. And so one of the things I saw when I joined Yahoo, we were about 3,000 people. I saw this company slow down, even though we grew the business and became larger. When I left the company 10 and a half years later on, we were about almost 15,000 people after laying off like three or 4,000 people. And one of the things I noticed is that as we got bigger and bigger and bigger, it became very, very hard to adjust and shift to sort of like the outside world and shift to sort of like customer trends. Um, and because of that, you're seeing a lot of companies having a hard time keeping up, right? And so what I find is that the bigger the organization is, this is organizations, countries, um, schools, the bigger they are, the harder they are sort of to sort of like follow the customer feedback and the trends because you just get, I would argue, dumber, right? Because it's harder to change. The other thing that's actually happening and, and what I think is actually, you know, one of the larger trends I see is, you know, as I mentioned to you, the cost of startups actually gone down precipitously over the last 10 to 15 years. And so I mentioned to you the startup I worked at back in 99, 2000, this is a very, very different time, right, back then. Think about this, right? We didn't have things like uh, Amazon Web Services, cloud services. We didn't have things like Facebook, which reached like a billion and a half people, almost two billion people now. And so you basically just need to raise $5 million in venture capital money just to have a basic working product, right? That's not the case anymore. Now you maybe raise like a couple hundred thousand dollars, you can roll out a product. And so because of this, you're seeing the cost of startups actually drop dramatically, and that's a good thing. And because of that, this is all these startups now are eating big companies, right? Because as a startup, you're, they're growing faster and faster, and big companies can't change. You're seeing a lot of these elephants being eaten by ants, these, the startup world. And you're seeing this happen in every single industry. It's not just the software industry. You're seeing this happen in every single industry, the energy industry, banking. You go down the list, a lot of the old world industries, it's happening. And so one of, the, one of my favorite, favorite quotes of how we think about the future is that the days of companies with the names like General Electric, General Mills, and General Motors are over. 
The money on the table is like krill, a billion little entrepreneurial opportunities. And that's what's so exciting these days. And so because of this, of this threat, if you believe everything I mentioned to you earlier, that large companies, large organizations are under threat, it dramatically changes how you should be looking at work these days, right? Because I think one, one of the unfortunate myths that we're taught, that we raise at particular, you know, I'm 43, right? One of the particular myths was that go to school, get, you know, get good grades, get a job at a big company or join the government and you know because it's like safe and secure right if you believe everything i said to you that's actually not true right and so these are two books i recommend really really good books to talk about sort of like where the world is going for jobs highly recommend them and because of that if you think about this in every single organization what is the biggest cost of a company right now particularly a big company it's the people, it's the salary, right? And so if all these companies are actually under threat right now, you cut costs. That's the way you keep up, right? When you cut costs, you know, the, what do you, how do you do this, right? It's through software and automation as well as outsourcing. So the way that you replace jobs and people is by bringing more automation, software, robotics, as well as outsourcing these jobs to India, to China, to places that, where people will do this job for cheaper. And because of this, this is destroying all those classical middle class jobs that we used to consider white collar good jobs. And we should all be scared about this, right? I'll give you an example, like if, as a banking teller, remember? You know, we used to, um, this is for me, maybe I'm old, right? So I used to go to bank, you know, now this is a time before like ATM machines. Think of what the ATM machine has actually done for banks, right? It's made it better to sort of work with banks. It's also removed a lot of like bank teller jobs as an example. You're seeing autonomous driving. You know, I'll give you an example why I'm dead scared of autonomous driving in many ways for how this is going to affect society. In the U.S. alone, there's 3.5 million truck drivers. So think about that. If we have autonomous driving trucks, that's 3.5 million families in the U.S. alone that are going to be affected. And so this should be scary, right? And this is not just, you know, like blue-collar jobs, factory jobs. These are actually, you're seeing this happen with software. You know, software can do the job better in, in cases of lawyers, bankers, any white collar job you think about, software will eventually be able to do better than human beings. That should be scary. But, you know, that means that it requires a major sort of mindset change. And so I, I love this quote by um, Jay-Z, right, who actually is an amazing businessman. He's like, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business, comma, man, right? So you have to think about yourself as a business, and I'll explain. And the good news about this is, this is a great time to be a business person. Because of everything I mentioned to you, the rise of platforms and global distribution, right? So I'll give you an example. You can build businesses now from anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter whether in Lithuania, in the US, in Canada, where I'm originally from, from Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera. You have these platforms that reach billions of people everywhere. I'll give you an example. Facebook now reaches almost close to 2 billion people, right? Uh, Instagram reaches over 700 million people. Amazon reaches over, I think, easily like you know, hundreds of millions of people. Keep on going down the list, right? Because of these platforms now, you can build it from your Apple App Store. You can sell your app on the Apple App Store to people all over the world. This has changed how you do distribution. The other thing that actually this has done, because we have close to two, three billion people online now, in the old days when I first started off on the internet, 99, 2000, starting in a niche, it actually was like, there was very, very small audience online. Now with three billion people, these small little niches are actually quite large. And there's this really, really great, um, qu not quote, but just article I actually read like many, many years ago, it's called A Thousand Raving Fans by Kevin Kelly. And he talked about the fact that if you actually have a thousand raving fans, that's enough for you to actually build a good, solid business as an entrepreneur, right? Think about that. 1,000 raving fans. If you can't find 1,000 raving fans online, you're doing something wrong. And so being able to focus very, very deeply on a very specific niche is actually the way that you're going to win. Other great things is knowledge is everywhere now. You actually don't have to go to university anymore just to get the knowledge, right? There's tons of books that are available. And even better, you have things like Udemy and full disclosure, one of our uh, portfolio companies. You have edX. You can take classes on everything and anything that you want to learn on, whether it's biotech, which is an area I'm deeply interested in, or it's online marketing, um, how to sort of like edit videos, whatever it is that you want to learn about, you can actually find it online. It's actually really cheap and easy to sort of learn this stuff. 
And so this is a good thing for any entrepreneur out there or really anybody out there. The maker movement, I mentioned to you tools. There's tons of really, really cheap tools. You want to build a website, you have WordPress. Um, you want to basically launch like um, an e-commerce store, you have Shopify. There's tons and tons of stores. And because I think you're seeing sort of like mass production right now, like people are kind of bored with mass production, there's actually a real need and actually interest by consumers of actually like craftsmanship and art, you know, artisanship. And so you're seeing this rise of like maker movements of like little small batch, custom, crafted, could be soap, could be books, could be anything, and there's actually real value to this. And so you can build really interesting businesses focusing on this stuff. Um, we're seeing another thing, the rise of digital nomads and geo-arbitrage, right? I mentioned to you earlier about the fact that you can build a business from pretty much anywhere in the world right now. And so what I'm seeing is actually a good part of my friends are actually doing this digital nomad thing. They basically have a business, you know, maybe it's an online sort of like e-commerce store, maybe it's they, they consult or they're a programmer based here in Lithuania or Estonia, and they basically have customers in the US or in Europe where they're actually getting paid US dollars and euros, and they're living in a lower cost infrastructure, right? Um, I have a friend, she, she actually works at a very, very big bank. She's actually based here in, um, in Vilnius, and she actually gets a salary from the UK, from big UK banks. So you're seeing there's a lot of these very, very interesting geo-arbitrage opportunities of living in a lower sort of like cost structure place, but actually getting paid in US dollars, in euros, and getting paid actually in, say, San Francisco wages. Think about how much money you can actually save, right? And the lifestyle you can actually afford. And this is actually the time. You're, we've seen the rise of these digital nomads over the last like five to 10 years, this idea of geo-arbitrage. Um, and I wanted to talk about this guy. I actually never met him. I, I don't know, we're friends on Facebook for some other reason, but like, I, he's actually from here. You might even know him. Um, he's actually a digital nomad, so it's like, be like Tomas. Um, so what he, right now, I believe he's actually in, Central, in Mexico, I think? And so this idea of geo-arbitrage, you can almost like live and build your business from like anywhere. And so he's actually been a very, very successful entrepreneur, designer, he started a bunch of businesses, and he makes his money, um, and he actually teaches this thing called life design, right? Um, and so, you know, the point, the reason I actually want to show this is actually, this is actually a Lithuanian guy who's doing this and living this life right now. If you can do it, I think like most of you all can do this, if that's something that you like. The other thing too is that there's a very, very clear path forward, right? There's lots and lots of books, there's lots of knowledge online to show you how to do this, to build these online businesses. And so if you, this is something that's interesting for you, I would strongly recommend you know, Tim Ferriss's 4-Hour Workweek, kind of the Bible for digital nomads and, li and sort of like lifestyle design. Um, you know, work the system on how to scale your business. Uh, never work again, sounds really like a really, really scammy sort of like late night um, sort of TV ad, but it's actually one of the best books on how to think about building a good sort of online business. And the other thing, the other sort of like person I actually point out is a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk. Who here has heard of Gary Vaynerchuk? Couple of people, right? I, I mean, I actually think like the model of his life is actually very, very interesting. So let, let, me, let me talk a little bit about Gary. Um, he started off, um, he inherited his dad's wine company. It's an offline wine company. And you know, this is back in like the mid 2000s when a lot of these like social media tools, whether it's like Twitter and Facebook, uh, YouTube, some of these things started arising. So he actually started doing a lot of like putting and pushing a lot of his products actually online, one of the first. And what is interesting of how his career has actually progressed is that he became an expert in actually social media marketing. And because of that, he actually wrote a book. He actually wrote a bunch of books. And because of this as well too, he learned a lot about social media, how it works. A lot of big companies came and said, hey, can you consult for us? So he actually started making money doing consulting as well too, besides growing his business online. Then the other thing that he actually did was that he started investing as an angel investor. And because he knew so much in the early, you know, so with this change into social media, one of the things he ended up doing was he ended up, in, he ended up becoming an early investor in Twitter, in Facebook, in Uber, and he made, like, his portfolio is an amazing now. He made a lot more money, actually, from, you know, you know actually from his angel investments from, than from his business. And then what he did, he parlayed his consulting projects into starting this very, very big social media agency that's now, I think they have like 500 people. And so he works with a whole bunch of these very, very big brands. Um, and now he's actually become his own sort of like media company. If you see him, he's actually probably one of the most like followed people on Instagram, 
on Snapchat, on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube. And so he's kind of built this incredible sort of like media company centered around himself. And so I actually think that it's a really interesting model for sort of how a career, this sort of almost like reactive and the same time sort of like strategic sort of career he's actually built out. Um, and the idea of just like now, if you believe this idea of all these amazing sort of platforms being out there and social media still continue to be a major driving force, you can basically build your own brand. And so you need to start thinking about yourself like a media company. And I think he's one of the best examples of this. Um, and so a couple key lessons actually from my presentations, right? Um, number one, you know, that I want you to take away from this is learning is actually way more important than earning. And so too many times I talk to friends of mine that are like, they, they always talked about optimizing, like I want this job because it'll pay me more money. That's actually a, a very, very dangerous th way to sort of think about your life. I actually think the best way to think about your life is actually you should be optimizing for learning in your career because things change so quickly and the skills you actually develop will carry you for a while, right? Think about what I do right now and, and maybe I'm probably, maybe another example of this. You know, I, I started, did startups, I worked at big companies, and now I'm an I'm a investor. But I also speak at a lot of conferences, I do consulting, I do a lot of different things as well too. And this ability to sort of like keep up, the only ways I'm able to do this is by continuing to learn on a regular basis, right? I invest a lot of my own money and time into learning. I have probably close to 4,000, 5,000 books in my house in San Francisco alone, so I read two to three books a week. I watch a lot of videos, I listen to a lot of podcasts, I actually spend, I'd say $50,000, $60,000 a year just going to conferences, of just like random conferences and workshops just to learn about things that are happening in the online marketing world, in various industries. And so investing in your learning is actually really important if you want to have or be able to thrive in the future, right? The other thing too is your network is your net worth, is that really, really important, especially for young folks right now, is actually building your network out um, and getting mentors is actually really critical. Um, and the reason for that is the, your network is the one who can potentially get you future jobs, give you future opportunities. Let's say you start a startup. These are people that can potentially help you find investors. These are people that can potentially help you like fix certain things in your business or find people to join your company. And so your network is actually really critical and something that I actually think is worth more than actually money. Actually will lead to money. The other part is like niching, right? Focus on a niche, preferably something you care a lot about or are deeply interested in. I think anytime you just chase money is a mistake. Um, other part, side projects equal to side hustles. Um, everybody needs to have a side project, right? And I think this is a very Silicon Valley centric thing. Like I have lots of friends who are like engineers at large companies at Google, Facebook, and on the side they have either startup or they, they bartend somewhere, they drive an Uber, they just like do a lot of different things. They have these side projects, they blog. Um, they have an e-commerce store. Having multiple interests and different business interests is actually really smart. And the reason for that is that you have to build your portfolio of skills and income. And, and the reason for this, right, is because if you think about like, a lot of times people tell you like, well, why would you do a startup, right? Or why would you be an entrepreneur? Being an entrepreneur is risky. And my argument is like, well, wait a minute, like, I would argue having a job is risky, right? Because if you, let's just say you are a consultant, you have like, different customers, say five or six customers, you lose one customer, you still have at least four customers, right? So you have four income streams versus five now. That's less risky than having a job with one income stream and then it disappears. So think about which is more risky, an entrepreneur or having a job? Something to think about. And so building this portfolio of skills as well as building this portfolio of income streams is very, very important to thrive in this future. The other thing I mentioned to you is be notable and not credible. What do I mean by this? Is actually brand and reputation really matters, right? And so if you focus on a niche and be known for sort of being very, very well known in that area and being the, the number one player in that niche and also just building your reputation and actually just building your brand, that's actually how you stand out, right? Because the challenge right now is that you're not competing against other people in Vilnius or Lithuania, you're competing against everybody in the rest of the world. And so having the brand is the only way that you can actually stand out. And the, other th the last thing I mentioned is that, you know, you need to think like a media company, right? So being a media company one, leverage all these great platforms, all these great media platforms all across the globe. Because, and, and maybe at least in the beginning focus, and if you're interested, you should read some of Gary Vaynerchuk's books who can give you some guidance on this, um, or at least give you some basics on this stuff. And all this stuff is all online, you can actually find it. 
please learn to become a media company one. And so I, I, one, of my, one of my favorite, favorite sort of like, like people I, I follow and read is a guy named Tim Ferriss. And has this really, really great quote. He says, the more involuntary suffering you build into your life, the less involuntary suffering will affect your life. All right? So think about that, right? Think about that. And, you know, everything I mentioned to you were just like helping you and hopefully helping you think about sort of more of an entrepreneurial life and entrepreneurial thinking. You know, the reason that you want to do this is to really have an impact, right? And so to sort of end off with my sort of like final quote is that, you know, the new definition of billionaire is somebody who positively affects the lives of a billion people. And if you do this, you will inevitably make money and do well and thrive in the future. So hopefully, I, f I, I hope you found this presentation helpful, interesting, and I hope it gets you sort of like going to sort of do your own thing. So thank you very much for your time. Actually, we are the ones who have to thank you for coming no. here and um, giving such a great insights. Now, um, there is a time for question. Marlon, oh, please, question. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. please. Oh. It's, you know, you're not done. It's yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, to break, to break the ice, uh, you know, it's usually for Lithuanians takes 5 to 15 minutes uh, from my own experience to, uh, with the questions. But the first thing, can you please repeat the words you tell to the startups when we've been at your 500 startup office in San Francisco? When do you accept the companies into the startup program? What are the metrics? Um, so, so, okay, so the metrics, it depends, all right, I'll, and I'll, I'll explain that. So it depends, right? So the way we think about it is if you, are, if you are in a space that is like super, super competitive, we look for a lot more traction, right? And what does that mean? So if, let's say you're an enterprise SaaS software, like I'm looking for at least like three to four customers, you know, some paying customers preferably, or at least pilots. Um, if you're enterprise SaaS, could be 10 to like 30, 40 thousand dollars in MRR, and the reason for that is because our program is very, very much focused on sales and marketing. So if you actually don't have a product, we we aren't going to be as helpful for you. Is that sort of the answer? No, not no. really. Yeah. You just have to add as well the uh, what about revenues? What about customers you gaining? Yeah. Can so you give us as well the metrics and insights what you like at uh, 500 startups. So like I said, it depends, right? So yeah. there are some spaces like, like we care a lot about, about ha you know, our focus is on helping you get customers. And so if you don't have a product or being a three and a half month, four month program, you're just not going to get very much out of the program. Just, you know, I'm trying to give context. And so generally speaking, what I like to see is I want to see some revenue because to be frank, revenue shows that there's something and somebody out there wants what you're building. Right? In my view, it's just the general advice I give to sort of like most startups, like whether you're a consumer-focused startup or you're a business-to-business -business focused startup, start charging right away. Because the fact is, if people aren't willing to pay for what you actually have, then you probably aren't building, <laughs> you probably aren't building sort of like the right thing or you're targeting the wrong market. And that's the best way to figure out whether you should be working on this or not. And so my advice is I charge as soon as you possibly can. Gentlemen, we have uh, a Yulia with the fancy microphone, which she will throw at you uh, when you would raise your hand. It's been noted that we have a very smart platform to get the questions on, which is slido.com, and the hashtag would be FT Futurepreneurs, that's uh, in the syllables, and 2018. So that's FTPR 2018. Um, so does anybody have a question? Yeah, there are two questions there, no. please. Catch. Catch the microphone. <laughs> Folks. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, my name is Sayan Nandi, and I am from India. I am here as an international student. So I just want to know you are a venture capitalist, and if I have any idea, then I need to come to you. And it's not like, I just start a business in India, not in Lithuania. Is it okay? Yeah, we, we invest all over the globe. So, sir, I have an idea, but I don't have an, any money. So, should I come to you or just wait and earn money in company? For you? Yeah, so my, my general view is just like, I, I, this is venture capital is a little bit sort of like strange, right? But the reality is that we want you to at least like have 
invested a little bit of your time and your money to go and build something because it doesn't cost very much. And we want to see some data about like how well you're doing, what you've learned along the way. And so generally speaking, we're probably not the people. You probably want to be talking to angel investors if you don't have anything yet to sort of get you started. We want to see, you know, we're an institutional investor, right? So we, we are venture capital fund. We take money from corporates, funds of funds, other people to invest on their behalf. And so we don't just invest in ideas, at least for our stage. We invest in sort of like working products and businesses already. So sir, I have a already plan, um, but sir, I don't need have any finances, but the government of my India said, when you have the degree, we will give you 60% of loan, like 30% from bank and 30% from organizations that we are having with our collaboration. So I am waiting for my degree. If I complete that degree, then I will go back to my country and start this one. Can I contact you? Like after finishing my degree? Sure, you can contact me. <laughs> oh, okay, sir. <laughs> you, you actually have to persuade Marvin to give you a term sheet. You said, can I contact you? Will you give me a term? Yeah. That <laughs> means investment paper. No, I'm of course joking. But uh, at 500 startups, you have a node in India, don't you? The people working in, in India for you. Yeah, we have some people there. Yeah. So you better contact the local people the Marvin will lead you to. Yeah. So because 500 startups is all over the globe as a Marvin. Sir, my business plan is also like with biotech because India is a, has a lot of dirt, pollution and everything. So I just want to clean everything. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can yeah. you please press the mic to the next, uh, next person because you'll be allowed to talk to the Marvin during the coffee break and discuss the details. Uh, okay. Can you please, who's the next one with the uh, one for the mic? Can you please pass it to the other person? Throw it, throw it. Okay, <laughs> does anybody else has a, has a question? Yeah, there was one in the back. Can you throw the mic there? All right, well, Marvin, first off, uh, thank you for your presentation. I really got a lot of value out of it. Uh, my question kind of comes from this new like work paradigm that you were talking mm -hmm. about, kind of like in the world or like this post workday world when you're focusing on a, on a startup or when you're building your niche for your product, mm -hmm. what do you find is easier to get it into a marketplace to make it more successful? Like in, let's say, uh, like the sphere of Lithuania, should you focus on a niche that you can get a lot of value out of like the Lithuanian market? Or should you keep kind of like a global mindset where you can reach a lot of different markets and not just like a specialized market? Um, I don't, you know, I, I frankly speaking, don't think that it actually really matters. I think a lot of it should be driven by sort of like what your interest is. You know, it's, it's a combination of what your interest is and what the market's sort of like looking for too. I, I ultimately think that if you're trying to build a great big, big business, then starting sort of like thinking global is helpful, but you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. And trying to understand sort of like, if, you ha if you're solving a, Lithu a specific Lithuanian problem, does this actually sort of like compound sort of like outside like is this relevant to sort of countries and other countries and globally right um, but my view is just you want to start somewhere and sometimes it's actually better to start very very small and focused you're going to learn a lot of stuff along the way mm. and so there's no right or wrong answer but you do have to start somewhere and this isn't a bad place to start okay great thank you thank you for your question sure anybody else yeah there's one guy there I'm sorry, lady. lady. Uh, hello, my name is Gadia, and uh, I wanted to ask how uh, NGOs do play into the startup market. Uh, do you find yourself working a lot with NGOs, and can they help startups, or can startups help the NGOs? Yeah, Thank you. to be honest, um, I don't run into a lot of NGOs, um, and vice versa, where I, I think particularly in Europe and Canada, you do see a lot of NGOs actually interacting with the startup world, and most cases are like education from an educational perspective. Um, that's typically where I see a lot of interaction. Um, unfortunately, Silicon Valley tends to be a little bit more like capitalist and Darwinistic, so we just don't really run into a lot of NGOs, to be honest. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, um, so you had any startups from Lithuania lately? Not, not recently. We've had a couple from, three from Latvia, okay. right around the corner, and then we've had two from Estonia. 
So um, not yet. But has they been have been you know funded or have been they accepted to acceleration program? Yeah, they they went through our program. And can you tell us uh, just a bit about uh, some of the companies which entered and one of their success rates? Um, so it's still early. So one of our companies called Funderful that just came from um, Latvia, they graduated about a year ago. And so they ended up raising, I think, like $500,000. You know, it's not bad. It's still early. Um, and another company, um, Clanbeat, Estonian company, um, and they also ended up raising roughly about the same. So it's still early days. Yeah, so early days. And t tell us about uh, you know the funding culture. Um, so is it you know when I've been uh, with the ten teams uh, from Lithuania in Silicon Valley, what I heard is usually every meeting we went to, it's how to raise the money for early stage. Yep. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, right now, if you take a look at overall venture capital, you know, sorry, like get really VC nerdy here, but if you take a look at a lot of the overall sort of numbers, what has happened is that even though venture capital, you've seen a lot of money stream into venture capital in the last, you know, I'd say seven to eight years, it's almost pretty much stayed the same, like the total amount that's actually being deployed in, in regards to deals. The issue is that most of the money is actually happening at the later stage. And so you're seeing a lot of the early stage, like seed, pre-seed stage, a lot of the money has actually disappeared and actually disappeared since 2015. And the main reason for that is, is even though it looks like there's a lot of VC money, it's due to a lot of the big deals that are being done. So for example, uh, SoftBank just recently invested like $300 million into WAG, right? Yeah. And so the later stage VC capital is actually distorting a lot of like those real numbers in early stage, like for a lot of my, my accelerator batches, it's incredibly challenging to fundraise, right? And we're like a top three program. And so even in Silicon Valley, it's very, very hard to fundraise in early stage. Um, and so bootstrapping, my view, is actually just as good. You know, get money from customers. And can you tell us a little bit about your, let's say, top three favorite startups you have seen within uh, 500? Uh, sure, sure. Happy to talk about that. Um, one of the companies I went through my first program is a company called Shippo. Um, they ended up just recently raising like $30 million. They've raised in total like $50 million now. And so what they are is they're an API and they work with a lot of like small e-commerce companies. So one of the biggest challenges of e-commerce companies, and so for any of you, if you actually happen to start a you know, e-commerce startup, one of the biggest challenges is actually the shipping part. And so what they do is that they work with a lot of like small startups and it's an API. And so what they do is they plug into this API and if you want to order stuff, you know, what they do is they combine the orders of like the shipping from like all the different sort of startups that use their service and they use that to negotiate better deals for these startups, right? So it's like, um, it's like a shipping sort of like API system that, and they're doing very, very well. Um, another company, a company called Neighborly, um, also just recently raised, I think like total of like 50 or $60 million from some very, very good investors. Um, they are a marketplace for municipal bonds in the US. And I don't know if you know municipal bonds in the US, it's like a trillion dollar business, it's huge, right? And so if you are a city or you are a state or you are the federal government, um, and usually it's, it's city and states, the way that you actually try to sort of survive, let's say you have, um, you want to finance like a new park or you want to build some roads, you actually sell bonds. And so at least in the US, what has happened is that before like you know, 40 years ago with these municipal bonds, um, the cities would just sell them directly to people. And now there's like Wall Street has actually come in. So you know, what's happened is that the cities are not getting as much money because a lot of that's being taken off by, you know, as they sell through Wall Street. And so what they do is they disinterme disintermediate Wall Street and help these cities and states actually get more money. And that's a good thing. Um, those are probably the top two. Thanks. Um, so. Uh, Marvin, thank you very much. Um, you've been a thank you very much. great talker. Yeah, great. Great speak thank you very much. Good luck to all. Uh, the teams at the, uh, and the people at the Futurepreneurs Pre Acceleration Program, you know, you're very happy to have such a mentor, uh, a mentor as Marvin because most of Pre Acceleration Program would die to have him in. You know, because 500 startups is a, is a huge brand name uh, in a startup world, as you know. So, guys, if you won't be able to have a chance, I know he's going to be very busy during the coffee break. So the ones who has him as a mentor, try to get him as much out of him as possible as you can. Because it's not only, a, you know, a, the bright-minded person, but it's very 
very well connected and not only in the Silicon Valley, believe me. So once again, thank you very much. And we'll, we are heading to the, uh, our next presenter, which mainly possibly uh, not have to be uh, presented uh, locally because the company Deeper is very well known. Is, is there anybody in the, uh, here who doesn't know what the Deeper does? Oh, there is there is Dutch people. There is Dutch people who doesn't know what. So, the, our next presenter is Edwin Asvosilius, who is heading deeper, and he's head of business as development EMEA, and he's going to uh, tell you about one of the fastest growing ten companies in that region. So, Edwin Asvos, you are more than welcome on stage. Applause. <laughs> History doesn't change through evolution, it changes through revolution. When the first human hooked some bait on a line and caught a fish, it was a revolution. Suddenly, humans had a whole new way to survive and prosper. Fast forward hundreds of years to another revolution, sonar. Now the oceans were no longer a mystery. Using boat sonars, humans could see the world below the surface. Fast forward again to 2012 and the wireless sonar revolution. Wireless communication created incredible new experiences for anglers. There we go. Fish Suddenly, on. fishing from the shore was no longer guesswork, all driven forward by deeper. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to see so many of the entrepreneurs in one space. Uh, thank you for a really interesting presentation about VCs. Um, I will try to share our lessons learned and a story uh, of Deeper, how we came from an idea uh, to eighth fastest growing company in uh, EMEA region and first uh, fastest growing company in Baltics. So just once again, uh, I haven't seen uh, how many of you know Deeper. So it's like half of them. I will try to be more specific of what we do and uh, what's our key selling points and things like that. Uh, so in brief, uh, we in, in March we will celebrate a uh, sixth uh, birthday. So the initial idea came in 2012 when two Lithuanian guys went to Finland for a fishing trip. And we had lots of uh, loads of uh, issues with the uh, traditional boating sonars. Uh, so we came with the idea that why not uh, create a castable wireless sonar, which would work in conjunction with your smartphone screen. Uh, and after one year in 2013, uh, first mass batch was uh, introduced into the market. And since then, we have a crazy journey to, to what we have it now. Uh, probably I will share uh, a few uh, most uh, most of our achievements. In 2014, we got an invitation from uh, Apple retail stores, uh, uh, and we got accepted in 120 physical stores around the Europe. Uh, so this is the first fishing product globally, and uh, the first product in Baltics generally who got accepted into Apple stores. Uh, since um, that acceptance, we got uh, really s scaling and got really into international uh, business. Uh, and uh, in 2015, another great award from Consumer Electronics Show CS in Las Vegas. Uh, who, who wa once who doesn't know, it's the uh, largest uh, consumer show where the largest brands in the world uh, present their latest in innovations or latest products. So out of uh, 4,000... Uh, participants. We were s nominated uh, as best wireless technology and actually 20 companies was nominated. So it was Samsung, Ford, Logitech, uh, Canon, Deeper and, uh, and 14 others. Uh, now we are in 2018 and launching already new products. So I will tell you more about it. A uh, little bit more of the numbers. So within uh, 
five years when we are selling and six years as a company, we managed to create our own segment in the, in the market. Uh, no one before was uh, creating uh, wireless sonars. Uh, so we can proudly name that uh, we are number one castable sonar in the world. Uh, actually, what uh, happens then a fisherman uh, or anglers, they speak about castable sonars, and sonars. They sometimes say that, uh, oh yeah, I know deeper or I have deeper, but it doesn't mean that they have our product. Maybe they have a competitors, but it's the same like with GoPro. Uh, if you name a GoPro, it means that you have an action camera and it's the same like uh, all traditional brands. So now we are 65 uh, employees, uh, all based in Lithuania, and um, it's excluding manufacturing. Actually, we manufacture in Lithuania, and one more proud uh, thing that we are purely Lithuanian company because uh, founders are Lithuanians. We uh, work in Lithuania, we manufacture in Lithuania, uh, so we uh, really try to promote the uh, Lithuanian spirit behind the product. Um, last year we did uh, close to 10, uh, 10 million euros, really got uh, really, really close, but um, couldn't uh, overstep that number. Uh, we sell in 50 countries globally and um, we launch seven products already and in uh, March we will release a third uh, edition of Deeper. Uh, so let's, uh, let's discuss about uh, lessons learned and um, I would like to speak about the uh, idea first. Uh, everyone believes that you need to create a like really crazy, really innovative idea uh, in order to break through the markets, enter global markets and things like that. But actually just uh, look around and you will see many outdated technologies, many outdated fields uh, which haven't been touched uh, of technologies for ages. For example, our idea, the sonars itself, they exist uh, 50 years in market overall, but we mainly were used for for um, for military perspectives, for boats, uh, but we never used uh, from the shore. And we just uh, shredded the old idea into tennis ball size uh, gadget. We employed uh, uh, f smartphones, we employed the latest technologies, and we have an idea which never uh, never thought about this. Uh, but uh, even such a simple idea as it looks now, it has, uh, at the beginning, it receives lots of negative feedback and lots of, um, lots of refusal, I would say. Uh, so you as a owner of the idea has to really prove it or disapprove it as fast as possible. So this means that you have to believe it in it, but if it doesn't work, just, uh, just uh, you know, how to say, Die, uh, make it dead, you know, and move to another idea. For example, when we started with our idea, and actually when we st start entering the international market, 90% uh, of the distributors or partners, they said that it would never work, it's uh, cheating, or it takes the fun out of the game, and things like that. Uh, but what we did, we said, come on, just give us an hour, we will meet face to face because over the phone you won't close the deals, especially at the beginning. Uh, sometimes we ask, uh, let's give us uh, like a square meter in your, spa in your booth at the trade show. Uh, what we will do, we will um, come there, we will present our product and during the weekend, if there is an interest from, from the end users, we can talk. 90% of the times we close the deals and we got the contracts. And uh, now we, we do have some of the partners uh, which we make from 20 to 30% of the annual revenue just with one ball, the, one, uh, the deeper. Uh, talking about um, other lessons. So let's say that you came up with an idea, you managed to launch it, congratulations guys. But you have to really move fast because uh, in 2014, we launched our first product, and uh, within it took us two years to launch a second generation product, and within these two years, we got four copycats. And uh, you can expect that within the first year, at least someone in the world will do the same what you are doing. And, uh, and it could be anyone. For example, in our case, it was not only Chinese, it was Russians, 
It was Canadians, it was Koreans, and even Americans who copied our idea, and they uh, introduced the castable sonars in the market as well. So really move fast, uh, try to think in, in advance, and, uh, and don't be excited if you got uh, one or two deals uh, for long. You know, move to another deals and, and expand and expand as much as you can. Uh, talking about um, entering, uh, entering international um, teams and, and entering international markets, everyone wants to sell globally they really want you know to to go outside Lithuania, outside states everyone believes that you know you really can do only big business in uh, outside your home country but actually you have to have a international mindset and build international team if you want to succeed that uh, in our case there are a couple of um, simple lessons for example uh, at the beginning everyone thinks that okay english is enough i can do business globally everyone speaks english but believe me once you try uh, try to speak in local language you will see a huge difference even in neighbor countries uh, like poland germany france they opened up for us once we start speaking the local language uh, for example one really good uh, case from our side uh, we were selling in china and we didn't have at that moment a chinese speaking person uh, so once we got a chinese speaking person after one year being in the market we found out that uh, our app doesn't work properly and with chinese uh, partners they couldn't uh, tell it us because it's part of the culture and part of the uh, language barrier and once we start speaking their language, we really got the real feedback from, from the market. So now, uh, deeper sales uh, team speaks over 13 languages from Chinese, Japanese, Korean, German, Polish, uh, English, uh, French, and all other uh, countries which are really important for us. Uh, talking about um, international sales team you really have to be adaptive you really have to have many different uh, skills uh, for example um, last year me personally i traveled uh, like 90 days uh, i was on the road but these days was not always the same uh, one day we are with suits uh, talking with walmart talking with best buy discussing about sales uh, and how we can open new stores uh, another day we have a uh, deeper hoodies, going to the trade shows, uh, selling our product, presenting, talking with end customers. Next day, we are in muddy boots. We are at the bank, at the shore, uh, filming with our heroes, film, uh, creating a content. And at all these uh, travels, or at all these um, moments, we are selling our product. Because it doesn't matter if we are in a business uh, discussion, or we are uh, in the lake or in the field, we always have to focus and see how and, and, and consider, you know, and, and, and think how the product can be sold and how it will be presented and what benefits it would bring to you. Yeah, um, one of the other lessons that uh, I, I really have to say that marketing uh, is major uh, reason of our success because we sell in 50 countries globally and without uh, being in line with marketing, uh, it would never happen. Uh, every time when um, sales and marketing wants to do something, we sit together, we organize strategy, we get in line just to uh, meet that country expectations. For example, we do have uh, 30 Facebook pages lo in local languages, which means that um, it's not enough to, uh, to once again, coming back to the idea of uh, languages, you know, that it's not enough to have a one Facebook page with English. We have different ones, 30 pages. We ha employ around 30 to 20 uh, social media tools and marketing tools in general from from all known Facebook, uh, Google, uh, YouTube, or, or Snapchat, or Instagram, to traditional ones, TV shows, banners, newsletters, um, fishing events, um, B B2B meetings, and all of that. We tried everything, and it really works, because 
if you want to scale as, as global as possible, you have to really be universal. You, you cannot focus on one field. And for example, we work in a really traditional field, uh, in a fishing field, in a, at, we work with the anglers, with fishermen, which uh, traditionally, uh, it's around from five to 10 years back, what we, uh, what kind of lifestyles we live, what kind of mindset we have. It's a bit outdated, but all employing all that um, tools on marketing helps anyway to reach and spread the word. Um, I would say that we are a content creation machine because we created over 750 videos about our product. We have uh, countless uh, articles, uh, TV shows, uh, blog posts, and all that which is related uh, to our product. We really employ uh, social media, we employ micro influencers in everyone in order to spread the word and to, um, and to do uh, like promotion for us. So one really important message that all that activities has to be in line with sales and marketing because you have to communicate the clear message and you have to adapt your message to local language and to local uh, communities. Otherwise, uh, you would uh, get, uh, you, you won't be understood properly. It would be misinterpretations. And everyone would think that um, you are just, you know, s doing something, but no one would understand uh, uh, what you do. Um, so let's say you have a business, you have uh, things already selling, you're international, you're successful, but uh, how to, scale it on a different level, how to be as, uh, as visible as possible. And one of the key things, uh, what we found, and I actually believe it's universal, it's your customers. Because um, your first customers and your customers in general is the biggest asset of your company or service because they can make you either successful or they can kill your company within, uh, within you know, a really short period of time. So a deeper what we did, we launched our heroes program, which it's actually brand ambassador program, but we call them heroes in order to, to feel us better and feel them better. And what we did globally, we invited well-known anglers to join our community and it's closed community. We do have now 300 uh, famous anglers around the globe who agreed to stand behind the product, who agreed uh, to try it, uh, to, to be a brand ambassadors. And uh, for example, uh, how it helped us, because uh, once we have a local uh, Korean or local Australian fisherman and a local end customer ask us a question, does it really work at that conditions or that conditions? It's not any more deeper who answers uh, th that question and it's not uh, a corporate answer. Uh, it's a local, uh, well-known fisherman who really knows the conditions. They answer to the end user. So what we really did, uh, we cut away the corporate message from from our communication, and we got the uh, local faces behind uh, the product. And uh, another thing that the community is uh, kind of closed. We do not accept everyone especially for the being a deeper hero. But there are thousands of anglers who are less known, but they're really active on the field and they're waiting uh, on the list in order to join the community. So we kind of created a demand in order to promote our brand. And uh, even such a small things like uh, giving them a limited apparel, a limited clothing lines, which uh, everyone would see that in the room, if you, someone of you sit with a deeper hoodie, it means that you belong to the company. You cannot purchase or buy it some, from somewhere else. So many things like that, that um, just localizing uh, your content, localizing your message and uh, localizing your activities together with, uh, with sales and marketing strategies would give you a lot of, um, a lot of benefits. Uh, another example, which is really obvious uh, actually, but for example, you go to a show in, uh, in some foreign countries. I just came back um, on Monday from uh, Netherlands, from Zwolle show. It's biggest uh, carp show in Europe which attracts over 30,000 uh, people uh, per, uh, per three days. 
uh, and it's most Germans, Dutch, and French people. If we go there with our English, it means that we could talk with, I don't know, 10%, 20% of the visitors who would come to our stand. But once we have a local guys, we talk to 100% of, of visitors who stopped by at our stand. So just such a simple thing so is really beneficial. And, and I believe this was my last lesson uh, which we learned and hope it helps uh, you to, to benefit and to succeed uh, doing business, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay on stage. It's not done. We have some of the uh, questions. Uh, so um, thank you very much. You're very kind. Um, so what is your net worth? You know, that's audience is asking. Do you know your net worth of your personal or uh, companies? Uh, it's really hard to, to answer such a question because uh, for us to, to calculate, you know, our uh, net worth or to calculate our potential or market cap, it's, it's really difficult. We don't know, you know, because uh, when we calculate how many d uh, units we sold per, um, uh, per country or per world, uh, we could grow in, we could even reach a billion because, you know, it's, uh, it's really that we tackled like a few percent of the, of the, of the local language, let's say, but we, we already doing like 10 million euros per, uh, per year and things like that. So the revenues, you have reached a revenue of 10 millions. Um, in um, startup world of Lithuania community, we have, uh, you know, this dream of having a unicorn, which at least would, uh, uh, you know, have one billion. So I guess applause, we have reached uh, the target audience, you know, one billion <laughs> unicorn. Um, so, you know, if you would give, the audience ask, if you would give the three main things, you know, just to stretch, what would be the three main success points you would make about the startup, tech startup? Uh, I would say team, first of all, it's really most important. Uh, believing in an idea, at the beginning, it doesn't have to be like the best idea. It's never like this. You would adapt and shape to the to the customer concerns and feedbacks. And uh, third, good good question. I I believe that uh, just uh, just doing everything what it takes. So it's again come comes back to the team, but really a uh, team. Uh, believing in it and doing what it takes. It always uh, would. Uh, uh, would pay back. Either, either though you find out that your idea doesn't work, you will do another things. But you would test yourself. You would uh, grow as a as an entrepreneur, as a founder. Um, last but not least, question: uh, The audience asked, "Is there any entrepreneur who's already passed away you would like to meet?" I would pass on this <laughs> answer. <laughs> Come again, sorry. Um, I, I would pass on this, so maybe it's a secret to which I want to meet. Okay, so it's um, audience um, um, who wants to give a live question. There's the hand there. Please throw the mic. Thank you. Where's my? Ah, yeah. Uh, Mindo Gazaremba from Institute of Biotechnology. Did you patent that your? Did you patent that this uh, your sonar? If yes. Uh, how do you protect your intellectual property? So probably the CEO and the owners of the company could tell more about the patents and how we protect, but uh, I know that, yes, we did. We patented uh, certain, uh, certain features and the product itself. And um, the only thing I can tell you that uh, I hear from time to time that we fight with this, um, these issues, but I couldn't comment more as I'm not involved in uh, this. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, there's a question there. Hello, um, I'm Lara. Uh, the question is that story which you've told is brilliant, right? Did you have mm -hmm. some big failure? And how did you solve it? Uh, 
talking about failures, it's uh, every day uh, we have failures and we have wins and that's the thing what I mean when you have to push really hard in order to adapt. For example, one of the funnest failures which we had uh, in 2013, once we launched a product, we put a carp uh, fish type on the box uh, because it's the most popular fish in the world. Uh, but it's actually not because in Australia, in states, they hate carps. They kill carps with dynamite. Uh, uh, they shooting them, and it's invasive species. Uh, so this is one of the failure, and we already manufactured the mass uh, mass batch, and we launched to the market, and we are like standing in the states in the trade show, and. Uh, companies comes and says, is it for carp? And we say, no, no, it's for universal. So we said, why you have a carp on, on your box? And things like that. So this is just first mistakes and it's, there are many of them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. We have to give a warm applause <laughs> to Edvinas. And it, it, was, it was a very interesting, uh, um, especially closing thought. The one person, famous person said, the success is going from one failure to another failure without losing enthusiasm. So I guess that was a question and that was the answer. Um, you know, the, the, next, uh, the next speaker is uh, as well, I think uh, we'll have the receiver more modest uh, questions and more fearful answers you would receive is I would like to present Camilia Kuboukaita, Ia Kuboukaita, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of Smart Swimming Company Ohio Swimming. So she's an expert who calls herself a technology geek. So nice to meet you. Technology geek, the stage is yours, please. Thanks. Hey guys, so first of all, I'm very happy to see you here. Could you raise uh, hands how many of you are willing and will start a startup within this program? How many participants we have at the moment? Okay, how many of you are thinking <coughs> about maybe starting a startup sometime in the future? Okay, so 75, yeah, no? Oh, great, thanks. That would be great, thank you. Okay, so today I will share a story of Oval, Oval a smart swimming company. Uh, so far, by far the most important thing in a startup world is be willing to fail. And that happens a lot, that happens a lot for early stage startups, and that happens more uh, in the process when you develop to the later stage. So I'm really happy that Deeper is here and I do consider uh, Deeper a rising star of Lithuanian hardware startup world in general. Uh, of course, uh, we of our were in the earlier stage, so I'm going to talk about the lessons that you yourself will face when you will start a hardware startup or any startup whatsoever. But firstly, about us in the beginning. So when the Apple Watch 2 was introduced, swimmers around the world thought, finally, we'll have a proper activity tracker because Apple introduced these cool, amazing features and uh, statistics to track for swimmers. Unfortunately, for the disappointment of the whole market, Apple Watch 2 was just yet another wristwear device and it's not possible to track any real-time feedback when you're training. And when you're a swimmer, don't have, if, and if you don't have a proper coaching during your workout, it's like swimming in the dark. You can put a lot of effort in it, but you won't know where you are. So that's where OVA was born. And we introduce you a first virtual coach for swimmers around the world. And it's very easy to train with OVAL. You just select the training program in accordance to your goal, put the tiny device on your swimming goggles, jump into pool, and follow the instructions of virtual training assistant. And we hope that this device will enable not only top-notch swimmers to reach their goals, but will encourage swimmers around the world 
to go into the pool more often. Currently, we are at our latest stage of prototype testing. We finally have the last version uh, and we will be ready to launch into the market at the end of this year. Uh, currently, we're working with swimmers from uh, 15 countries uh, that are ready to be our testers and we're working with institutes and organizations around the globe to test our device. But I want to go back a bit, uh, two years and a half, when OVAO was first formed. And today I will share three major things that I think you guys should think of before you start your startup. So first of all, and by far the most important thing is to know your customers. And I can't stretch it enough. Because when we first came into the market, uh, we talked with a few swimmers. We were quite happy about the solution that we land on. It was a heart rate monitor for swimmers. Uh, and we were ready to move into the production. But of course, then uh, we sat with uh, our advisors, uh, we take a huge breath and we realize that talking with just a few uh, customers is not enough. And when you're talking with your customers, not only you need to talk with a lot of them, you need to ask the right questions. And you will need to do that as well. So I really recommend to read a book, which calls a mom test, which basically a great book of how to evaluate your idea properly. So one of the examples uh, of the book, uh, say you are a co-founder of a company who wants to build a, build a cooking app. And you come to your mother and you ask, mom, do you have five minutes? I have a business idea I want to share with you. And your mom would say, yeah, dears, of course. And you ask, so mom, you like your iPod and you lose, use it a lot, yeah? And she says, yes, of course, dear. Okay, so you really like cookbooks, so if I will build a cookbook app, you would buy it, yeah? And your mom would say, yeah, sure, dear. But what she really meant is that she just used her iPad once in a while to check an email. She has 50 cookbooks in her closet she doesn't use, and what app is in general? So the takeaway of this example as that if you want to get a proper answers, you need to ask a proper questions. So if you are pitching or you're talking with your target audience, don't go ahead and pitch what you build because I know it's tempting because it's your baby and everyone loves to share their ideas and get applauses on them. But what you really need to have is you need to have a proper critique at the very beginning uh, in order to grow. And when you did that, and we did an extensive validation with 400 swimmers around the globe, and when we were uh, certain that we're de developing a product that solves the critic problem of our target users, we went on with our validation to the second point, which is talking uh, with possible partners. And as uh, Deeper made an example of talking a lot uh, with uh, Best Buy and all other bigger players in the world to kind of uh, see whenever they can make a deal and whenever Deeper could potentially go on the shelves of the big retailer, uh, we did the same. And it takes quite a lot of uh, time to go into the retail when you start, especially when you're a startup. Uh, so it's very good to start talking with them early, as early as you have your uh, working uh, prototype, you can talk with the initial players in the field uh, and maybe get their opinion on the product. So we were lucky enough uh, and we strike a partnership with Media Markt and we showcased OVAO in two countries, in Netherlands and in Belgium for live customers. And we not only showcased the product, but also we got um, the initial validation uh, of the target users. So approximately, I think, uh, 300 uh, swimmers, possible customers, interacted with our device. 
Uh, majority of them uh, indicated that they would be willing to buy the product. Some of them subscribe to our early stage customer list. Uh, some of them subscribe to our testers list. Uh, so main thing, when you're validating your idea with your target customers, you need to get free things from them. You need to get either their commitment of time, their commitment of money, or their commitment of reputation. So the commitment of money is the best one ever for startups because they're just willing to buy our product. Uh, the commitment number two time uh, is great as well, especially in the early stage because they are willing to test your product. And the third one, the reputation is, well, if the guy knows the owner I wanted to talk with, he's willing to introduce uh, him to me. So that would be the key takeaways of how to really know your customers at the very beginning. The second, and I can't agree more <laughs> with Deeper on that as well, uh, is choosing your team wisely. And I know uh, today you will be working on team forming and some of you might already have the team. Uh, so I would say two of the things matter in team building the most. So the first one is to have a very deep belief in your product. And the second, and I would say even maybe more important one, is to have the proper and different expertise within the field. So for example, when we first started building OVA, we had uh, five initial founders. Uh, so three of the founders were purely technical guys who were working on biomedical engineering for quite a few uh, years. Uh, and the head of our company, the CEO, he's in the field of business development for more than 20 years. So uh, I think at the very start, uh, this mix of expertise and different field expertise uh, make it, uh, made of our um, an early success. Uh, and the third, a bit of a funny <laughs> thing, but it's really important, especially when people are under um, a lot of stress, because you can just test your team after a while, because everyone is nice at the beginning, but after uh, weeks and weeks of deadlines and technical failures, uh, people tend to get into needy greedy things. So uh, we can attitude helps a lot, so I'd like to share one example from of our experience. We were working on two deadlines at once. So we were trying to uh, finish our uh, very early stage rough prototype for a certain Olympic swimmer that we wanted to test uh, of our with. And also we were working on product photo shoot and branding all at the same time. And uh, I was responsible f actually for uh, branding and product photo shoot. And I had like five different swimmers that were willing to go into the photo shoot with us. But all five of them called me one or two days before and canceled about various reasons. So I had the photographer, everything set up, but I didn't have a swimmer to actually make our photo shoot. So that is where our head of engineer, the guy who was struggling to finish the prototype, came in and he said like, yeah, sure, I'll be the face of our company. So not only we managed to finish the prototype and send it uh, for testing in time, we also had a quite a good face of the company, which is actually our head of engineer. Uh, and we still use him in all of our promotion materials. So we can attitude in a startup is a key thing. Third lesson, and it's very, very important, especially for hardware products. Uh, so you need to build your minimum viable product as soon as possible. So who knows what the minimum viable product is? Okay, not all of you guys, so quick explanation, very blurly is the earliest possible version of your product with the minimum amount of features that you can test as soon as possible. So it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to work properly at all times and all condition. It just has to work and you need to get it into the hands of the customers. 
So one of uh, very good and bad examples at the same time of uh, building an MVP or not building it at the right time is Juicera. So Juicera, I would say, is one of the stars of how not to build a hardware program, the products in the Silicon Valley. So uh, the company came into the market at 2016 with a uh, great success. Uh, they raised a very successful Kickstarter campaign, and in total they raised, I think, about uh, $120 million for uh, their development. And what uh, did they introduce? They introduced a smart juicer, which solves a lot of problems, and they introduce it not only the, as a hard up thing, but as a subscription thing. So uh, what they did, they had a juicer, and they had uh, a lot of packages of different juices that you can get into your house. So basically, you pay a fee for a juicer, and then you pay a monthly or weekly subscription fee, and you can have fresh juices every day. Personally, I love juices, and I would like to get involved uh, in a project like that, and I would like to own one. But the problem here, I think, uh, is pricing. Because the Juicera juicer itself costs around $700, which is a bit of more expensive even in US market. And the subscription was, I think, $35 a week. So although you have an amazing device and you have fresh juices every single day, it's still quite a big money to pay in the process, don't you think? Uh, but this uh, is not what killed them. The reason why Juicera bankrupt uh, at the late 2017 was the major mistakes that they made during the process of their minimum viable product building. Because in the consideration of the hardware, Juicero was brilliantly engineered piece of hardware. It was so sleek, it's amazing. I, I don't want to get into details because it will be a while, but out of engineering perspective, it was great. And the reason why it was so complicated because you need to apply um, a lot of pressure to squeeze a juicer pack and it needs to be applied equally, or so does engineers thought. But in 2017, they were proved wrong. There was an art article in one of the biggest um, uh, newspapers which actually showed that Juicero packs can be squeezed by hand in the same amount of time that is squeezed by Juicero juicer meaning that you don't actually need a $700 hardware device to use the juices. So this was a nail in the coffin for Juicero, and I would say it's from the two angles. The first angle, it was a huge engineering mistake because they should have thought about it earlier on. The second one is that they invested uh, all, at least all of the money, around 100,000, uh, to actually building all of the infrastructure, building a perfect product, and when they actually delivered to the market, it failed miserably. So therefore, uh, I would encourage you all, build your ugly prototype as soon as possible, and go to the market with it as soon as possible and don't follow the Juicera road. As for us, yeah, we did. <laughs> we built a uh, few ugly ones, uh, several of uh, good looking oval prototypes uh, and it's been a long road. We've been uh, through 13 different uh, product designs in the process. Uh, and the reason why it was so hard, because we raised ourselves a challenge uh, that our device should fit majority of most popular swimming goggles, and there's various types of swimming goggles. Uh, therefore, we went to 13 different uh, design iterations. But now we're happy. Uh, we have our final design, our community greeted it very well, and also, uh, in parallel with the design testing, we also shrinked our hardware. 
So now today I have the small prototype of OVA with me. So people who like swimming or just in general are tech geeks like me uh, can come and try it on. So in general, how the MVP should look like, as I said, uh, it should be with as few P features as possible. Uh, and you, but you need to have a technical plan in place from later stage development. And talk with uh, experienced uh, colleagues in the field. For example, when we first started, uh, we talked with technology startups, uh, uh, Deeper and other guys from the field, and actually they gave us a lot of great advices on how to develop a hardware and how not to develop a hardware. Uh, Test as soon as possible. Uh, the more users will feel your product or your app, uh, the better. Uh, and uh, have the right partnerships. Uh, this is crucial, I would say, for early stage startup uh, because team and the product, that's what gets you going. But what really fuels the engine is the partners and the early players that are willing to go with you in the field. So the more uh, partners you have, uh, the better. And the last but not least uh, out of the lessons that we learn uh, is that you need to build your contacts with media as early as possible. Why it's important? Because if you're thinking worldwide and if you want to introduce your product to the whole world, uh, you need a voice. So if you're not able to be your own voice or you don't have the money for it, you need to make right partnerships with media and then they will talk within your behalf. So again, repeating myself a bit, three most important things. First, you need to actually know that your product solves the very crucial issue of your customer and you need to validate it properly and ask the right questions. The second of all, team is what makes or breaks a startup. So you need to actually build and stress test your team within the process and build your minimum, po uh, minimum viable product as soon as possible and launch in the market. So that's it for me. And if you are still passionate about hardware startups or have more questions for me, feel free to ask them. Thank you for such an interesting presentation. And now time for the questions. So the audience um, asking employee versus startup owner. What would be for you three main arguments to go for the startup instead of white collar job? What do you think? Okay, so I think there are a lot of things uh, how to make this decision and uh, out of my experience in the startup world, uh, I met quite a few people who uh, chose startup versus white collar. Uh, the first and by far the most is that you are your own boss and then you are able to allocate your time and work on the product or the idea that you truly believe in. Uh, the second of all uh, is that you can gain a lot of experience fast within the scope of one or two years, especially when you're building early stage, uh, that you will not, will not gain when working in a white collar job. And the third one, I think, is uh, the freedom to move uh, and the freedom to work from anywhere because that's the privilege, I would say, that startup have. I can work in Lithuania tomorrow, jump in the plane and go to our research development in Netherlands or uh, fly to visit our partners in other countries. Um, the next question, which is quite far interesting, it's uh, how much kilometers do you swim a week, month, year? Actually, that's a very good question. Uh, I actually started swimming when I first joined OVA, so I would say not more than uh, five kilometers a month. I'm not the greatest example, but our one of our co-founders and the guy who actually had the idea, uh, he swims two times a week, uh, at least two kilometers a day, so quite a few ones in a month. 
And uh, the question as well is um, about the celebrities, sports celebrities. Have you have contacted uh, the gold prize medal winner, uh, Melu Tita? Um, is, is she on your uh, development team or somehow related to? So one thing that I can reveal, remember that uh, product that we were s kind of very in rush to develop and finish to send to certain golden medalist to test. I may or may not say that she was or was not <laughs> testing it. Yeah, so that's all that I can reveal. <laughs> it's NDA, non-disclosure, I guess. Um, is, do we have any question from the audience? Because I could read questions infinitely. Yeah, the hand there. My name is Pran at Vilnius University. I have, a, mm, have to repeat a question of my colleague, which is important for all hardware companies. Uh, do you use any measures to protect your intellectual properties? Do you plan to patent or somehow to, to protect? Or is it patent pending? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, we are in the process still of figuring out whenever patenting is the best way to go. Uh, because of the two things. So first of all, we uh, consulted with uh, the Patent Bureau in Netherlands and in Lithuania as well. So we do know that certain things of our technology can be patented, uh, but first of all, it takes a lot of time to get patent. Second of all, it takes even more money to sue someone when the patent is breached. So patents are great, for big companies uh, with law departments. But as for the startup, I think maybe later on in the road for this moment, no. Any other questions you might have? Okay, so been, um, thank you very much. It's uh, been a very interesting presentation of yours. Um, yeah, I'm collecting my uh, hardware, as I say and um, a small gift of appreciation if you'd run away yeah uh, that's good you swim fast you run fast it's fascinating i remember um, uh, i remember the founder of game inside um, the who resides now in lithuania he moved from uh, from moscow and he's running one of the biggest uh, mobile gaming companies igor matsuk told me like three to four years ago said you think you're good at software Guys, no way. You are a hardware nation. You know, it's interesting, very funny. And today I realized, damn, we are a hardware nation. Yes, we do a software quite well, but we do even better in the hardware. But, uh, you know, the, the world doesn't end on the hardware. Uh, and they said that, um, you know, this has to be, you know, somebody who have to drive an impact. And there are two brilliant uh, guys in um, our speaker panel today, which is uh, Bram and Kuhn, who are the partners of the PurePads. The PurePads is an impact-driven um, company based in the Netherlands, inspiring and challenging businesses to join forces for the more profitable, sustainable, and innovative supply chain. So guys, I welcome you on stage. So it's going to be the you're going to be the, the starter. There's a microphone for you, and the clicker. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. It will, but in yeah. the end, it's going to go off. Joking. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Just a few questions. Who is eager to become a future entrepreneur? Who believes sustainability is the biggest challenge now for economies, Lithuania? And who thinks that business can drive a change in it? Bram, we have a challenge the coming 20 minutes. <laughs> He's my partner, Bram. <laughs> we are from Pure Birds. We are impact-driven entrepreneurs. We have a dream that we can drive by business, a better world. Uh, because we believe, that's our dream, that we are connecting partners in the supply chain to create innovative, profitable, and sustainable value chains. Because our big challenges 
and people are really working together, together on it. So we are driving, we're connecting companies, uh, retailers, brand owners, production. They are willing to work together to drive this change, and we are trying to enable startups to have these opportunities. So we will give you some examples now to inspire, inspire you. I'm Kung Faber. Why? I was challenged to becoming this impactful. At the time uh, I was born, my parents lived in Africa, and they were really motivated on societal changes. So since I was a baby, they influenced me, they inspired me to change a lot of issues in society should be tackled differently. And I was studying sociology, economy, and I say I should get create impact in Africa. But by the time I thought it's not in the other parts of the world, we have a challenge as well in our country, in our, and nowadays I notice he's my son. I didn't have to inspire him. He's inspiring me every time. Why can I not be smarter? Why can't I be more, more efficient? And I'm part of an Indian company. I will explain later. I was three weeks ago in India. They're one of the biggest sugar producing companies. And they are really giving back to community. It's in their, their way of business. So we, if we, are, we were outside near the plants where the farmers were. They are creating schools. And always after then you play badminton with the kids. And you look, I look exhausted because she beats hell out of me. <laughs> but she was my double partner, so we won. But remember her, na her face. She was a great talent. She will be international. She's growing fast. And they are supporting. Everybody can make grow fast. And that's what we try also for businesses. Because there are a lot of challenges to come. There are a lot of systems that has to be changed. Oh, it's not in the southern part what I said, but it's also for us in the western part. Well known is of course the energy crisis. We have produced, we are too addicted to oil. We use it in everywhere and everything. And it's not only the oil we are addicted to, it's giving too much environmental harm in the energy use. In China, it's, if you talk to China country, cities, for them it's just the health. You know, the pollution of the oil's energy use is getting harmful. And it's getting closer. A friend of mine was in Kosovo, the capital, last week, and he said for a few days the city was closed because people are not, couldn't breathe anymore. So we should change some systems. Renewable energy is, of course, a solution for that. And you see it's a challenge. We set some goals for the European Union. And Lithuania is doing very well. <laughs> You're ninth. You're really reaching the goal. Although I always when I'm here, you're really modest. No, we are not focused on sustainability. <laughs> we are doing well. Because I'm very ashamed. We're almost lost as Netherlands. And the new numbers were even just in front of Luxembourg. Although everybody say Netherlands is doing great. <laughs> so we have a challenge. Because like many countries, Netherlands, we have a too much good grit. We are too addicted to it, we are too good working. So we have to change it, change different solutions. Can I just a little bit of water? Yeah. <laughs> I had a salty dinner yesterday. <laughs> so to get less use of the grid, the grid is too efficient, too cheap. So we have to change the renewable energy use from a business case. And we worked in the supply chain that you can have off-grid solutions with, with <coughs> testing our logistic service provider. To have the solar energy on the truck for the cooling and all the machines, to have a plug-and-play system. Because then you go off-grid to make a payback time. But the system itself, yeah, the solar industry has innovated a lot last year. It's becoming cheaper and you need the special connections. So the system can be used with also testing other countries, Middle East, India, where they don't have a good grid. And then you can, instead of building big solar farms, you can make it on house level. And we're testing it especially from the demand side. So the logistic company, the households, how can you use your energy demand and get it all the way used? That's making the smart combinations. 
fuel cell. I'm participating in this company. It's a, smart f a small fuel cell. It's like a Coca-Cola can. And it's used for micro, uh, micro systems. We, we, we enabled them with a lo launching customer, Liberty Global, one of the biggest uh, network for data. And he has, all, has a whole hub and nodes in Europe, in America, which takes a lot of energy use, small energy use. And now with this fuel cell, we can enable them just independent. It works for 80,000 euros. Needs only a third of a can to run on five years. And even not only hydrogen, it can also run on natural gas or bioethanol. So we have to think in existing systems to make game changes. And what we think, uh, we are really always working in the supply chains, that this addiction of oil that started in the last century, in the 50s, we have created a lot of value chains, production chains, so easily on oil. We're producing a lot, always cheap, and there's not from a demand side, but just pushing things. We're overproducting, so that should change. First, of course, we have to think of less using oil. We're going to non-fossil, and the possibilities are there. You can already, engineering people have worked last years on all kinds of solutions on working on non-fossil sources. As I said, I'm part of one of the biggest front runners in it. It's an Indian company, a sugar company, one of the oldest near Mumbai. And it's changed from sugar to a bio-based chemical. It makes products. It helps now we can do the coatings, paintings, uh, chairs, plastics. So it's creating these partnerships in this new value change you have delivered. Not working in the old model, but working in a new model. And as we do, this demand. And this demand is growing. So we are from of an example that we said on the shipping industry is one of the polluting sectors. You know, the 17 biggest container ships are exhausting sulfur as all the cars in the world. And nobody is pushing them because every country has don't have influence on the shipping industry. So who has influence are global brands. So we combined the global supply chain managers of some brands to see how can you cr combine and create a power of demand. And that's what we did. Just by pushing the carriers, how I show sustainable performance, and they are putting it in their tender. If you don't perform, you don't get business. So sustainability should be part and is part of the business nowadays. And we also invite them to co-create on how can we get these innovations in the sector? What are the enablers? What are the disenablers? And all as becoming more and more aware, it's not NGOs, customers, everybody's getting aware. The waste becoming all of this easy production value chain we have developed the last decades. And especially the plastic waste is becoming now it was, I say, it was always a business case, but we end up with a lot of plastics. <laughs> this is now 78 million tons of plastics are used, and it's growing, still exponential, and only 9% we're recycling. Most of it ends up in the ocean, in the environment, or landfill. So all these value chains have a lot of challenge. You are mostly linear based of people and you go to circular. So that's why we try to enable. I'm part of this startup who is using, can use these low plastics, very non-valuable, into new products from the, we can use from the ocean or otherwise into maybe terrace panels for your balcony or garden or uh, poles for the construction industry or your fences or oil, and these can also always be reused. We can upcycle them. So we don't need new virtual material. So we try to create a loop. And also to make this change, like this oil, plastic into oil is low sulfur, we combined the supply chain, the value chain. So the producers of the plastics and the users of the oil. 
you should work together from the beginning to create this business model. And also, as we said, you saw on the renewable energy, but also on this projections channel, even Netherlands has a big, big challenge to exchange, because we have used for decades to work in a way, and now we try to get a closed loop. So we have a network of several partners, companies, and also knowledge institutes who so would need this new knowledge upscaling. Um, and Bram will tell later on a big showcase he's uh, implementing now with the retailers coming out of the network. And the, we're happy to do it's also one of the awards. If you have a good circular model, the network of Dutch scientists from all fields are we are helping this award winning company after the demo day to get your business started. So sustainability is not a good feel good factor anymore. It's not like nice to have reporting. It's a must. It should be part of the business and it gives an opportunity. And we should make it more demand driven. Everybody, companies with you can have influence on the demand for the solution. And start working together. Also in small groups, you have a lot of influence. Ram. Thank you, Kuhn. It's great being here. Um, in October 2016, we uh, started uh, together with Sunrise Valley, the Futurepreneurs uh, uh, program. And it was so great to see all the eagerness of young entrepreneurs in Lithuania to really start with sustainable issues and solve it with entrepreneurship. Um, I'm, uh, again, I met uh, 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 Kuhn, eh? and I met Kuhn, and we have the same vision. My mission in life is to create impact in this world. When I was uh, young, I always asked the questions to my uh, mother, like, why are we polluting so much? Why are all the animals uh, disappear, etc., etc.? And now, these are my daughters, and it's really nice because uh, this is live. Eh? This is live on, on, on YouTube. So I can say something to them because they just uh, uh, are watching me uh, uh, on the screen because they are my biggest fan. <laughs> so, girls, I love you. <laughs> and what I want to tell you is a great opportunity that uh, I came to um, when I also started Futurepreneurs together with Kuhn and Sunrise Valley. It was in October 2016, uh, and I met uh, uh, Geert and Sandy, and Geert and Sandy were for 25 years in the cardboard industry. They built cardboard displays, and I will show you how these uh, displays got built. I, I never saw them in the supermarket, but if you see, in the, go in a supermarket now, they're everywhere. Everywhere in the world you see cardboard displays. And it's a niche. It's a niche, but it's a big niche. And they said to me, it's all about cardboard. Can we change this? And what Kuhn and I do, we start collaborating always with brands and retailers. So I said, we can start uh, organizing a co-creation session. And to also introduce to you, uh, because you need brilliant people in your team, this is Francesco. He's brilliant, but you will see it uh, later on. Uh, uh, but but why, we, why we started this? Uh, oh, a little bit too far. Oh, is this a PDF? <laughs> Not good. I will have more slides when you don't see anything. We have a challenge here. A billion kilograms of cardboard is wasted in the retail industry. Only in Europe, but in America, etc., it's at least the same. And we say, stop this. What we want to do is we want to inspire the world by co-creating a business model that is sustainable, smart, uh, social, 
and valuable for every stakeholder. And how we do this is we started this co-creation session and this was just before we started the business. Uh, now they say you have to uh, talk to customers, but we say you have to start with customers. What are their real problems? What, what issues do they have? What vision do they, uh, do they have? And we started this uh, uh, session and these brands are very small here, but you have Coca-Cola, uh, Kraft Heinz, Mars, Unilever, et cetera, et cetera. And Carrefour, one of the biggest retailers, uh, uh, um, and, uh, retailers in, in, in Belgium, Dalhese. And for the first time, those people were talking to each other. Most of the time, they don't talk to each other. So the supply chain is built from companies and it's all from their own perspective. And they think of, yeah, uh, this retailer is demanding this, that re retailer is demanding that, and that has another demand. And they don't talk to each other, how can we optimize this? So what we did was organizing a session, what is your big vision on promotions? How can you change this? And they say, we want it totally differently. What we want to have, instead of the cardboard that is wasted every time, uh, the, the one billion kilograms of cardboard, we want to have a reusable system, a circular model. But now, we're spending a lot of money in promotions, millions, they spend millions, but they don't know anything. Like Coca-Cola, if they have a promotion, they put a cardboard display in the store, but the, f the funny thing is, they don't even know if it even end up in the store. It could be stuck in the supply chain. It could be in the back room of the retailer. They don't know. There's no technology, nothing. Why? Because it's a one-time use. So what we did, and this is the lean startup model. Again, huh? very nice. I built it up, uh, but I will tell you. First, you build something. Huh? You build the minimum viable product. This is a metal version, what we did. We was we building a foldable telescopic system that is one piece, and the good thing is, we patent it. Uh, we could patent it because nowhere in the world there was something that was foldable. Yes, there is something that is foldable. Telescopics, of course, there is something that is telescopic, but there's nothing telescopic foldable in one piece, and then you have a patent. So, and again. We co-created, we showed the model, eh, after the first ver version, after the first co-creation, we came to the, to, to the model, uh, and, and they said, oh, this is really interesting. This is what we want. But can you add, add this and that and that? Of course, because it's your solution. It's their solution, it's not our solution. We facilitate the process, we facilitate the product, and of course it's our company, but it's their product. It's their product that they have to have in, in, in market. And every time we change the business model. Eh? If you have a startup, every time, every day, you change your business model. Eh? You're thinking of this, and it's totally there, and you're, you're, you're thinking of, of, of selling your company uh, for uh, uh, a lot of millions, and uh, afterwards you say, no, I like to do it ourselves. Eh? So this is what we uh, like. We really want to build it ourselves. We also build a showcase. This is important. Yeah. It's, it, some people call it a pilot, but a pilot you do and you think at the end, did it work? No? Okay. But a showcase is related to a mission that you have. It's related to what do you want to achieve with each other. But it has to involve all your customers. It has to involve all your potential uh, there. So this is a process and you see a lot of brands, you see a lot of retailers, you see a lot of uh, uh, brands and other partners. Six weeks earlier of the movie, we didn't have, we did have those contacts, but we didn't have any agreement on the showcase. We only had one item and we said to them, we can produce 50 items and we didn't have a producer yet. Uh, 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 and we will present this in an event in London. The event in London we had, but the rest we didn't have. And this was the first week we went to all the retailers 
one of them said, oh, I would like to present in London. So that was the first one. And they said, and he said, but I want that every reta other retailer is involved as well. Oh, perfect. So we asked the other retailers, Are you want to, do you want to be involved? Of course, but the brands also need to be involved. And what they did, they invited all the brands. So now we have a collaboration there already. We found a, a producer who could produce our item in two weeks. And all the brands said, but what you want to do for 23 brands is build a display uh, and said, put it in all these stores. Normally this takes 16 weeks and we don't even have uh, uh, and, and a lot of time more. And we said, we we'll organize it all for you. And in one week, or we organize it what they normally did in 16 weeks. We have a movie of this, but it's five minutes, so I won't show it uh, uh, to you, but it's interesting. You can see it on the, on the website. And the solution. We also won the Greener Packaging Award. And the Greener Packaging Award, it's uh, very interesting because a lot of brands were there as well. So Kellogg's, L'Oreal, uh, um, Procter & Gamble, they also won a prize. They won a prize like this, and we won a prize like this. And they didn't know who we were. Eh? They didn't know. They, uh, pure Value is the name, and the Pure Value. Who is this? But we won the prize. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. But this is the system. Um, I have uh, the movie tomorrow, so I don't have the movie today of the new item, but I will show you another uh, uh, a movie uh, just now. But also a big challenge was the technology, because there is the big business model. Also the companies tell us, like, okay, you have an interesting system, but everything is in IoT, big data, artificial intelligence, blockchain, etc. But I don't know anything about this. So then you have to find the right partners. And Procter & Gamble, they tell, uh, told us, we are testing with uh, uh, pellets with a new company in the Netherlands, and they integrated IoT and blockchain technology in the pellets. So they can follow the goods everywhere. And they can follow the temperature, they can follow the shock data. So if somebody throws their products uh, somewhere else, they know where it happened and when it happened. Uh, but they can also measure the weight. And this is very interesting for us. Uh, and, and, and the track and trace, of course. So now we know where our item is, when it's there, uh, and how much got sold. Because we know how much is going off. But this information is nowhere in the world, anyone has it. So they only have the point of sale data, but they don't have the real data, what is the customer related to the product do. So now we can also communicate to the customer. And it's all, it's, it's there already. Yeah, so we just needed to uh, start a joint venture with Arma, and we did. So we have now Arma Prote Pro Proteus Pooling. Uh, Proteus is the brand name. And um, yeah, this, this, is, this is very interesting. We have a video just before you uh, uh, open the, 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 the video. Uh, last night, uh, two o'clock, somebody sent me this, uh, this video. This was of a week, uh, a week ago. We were in Germany and introducing a totally new brand at a totally new uh, uh, customer for this uh, brand, a big, a very big retailer in uh, in Germany. It has 7,000 uh, large stores, um, but it's a new brand, and they needed to have an introduction of their products that it really was remarkable. So what we did, we used our system that we had before, eh, more of the vi minimum viable products. That's what you see. But if you go now in stores in Frankfurt uh, um, uh, at the retailer, you see our product. Yeah, so that's interesting. Can you start it?
So what is our plan for growth? Uh, because we are ready to go in mass uh, 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 production. Um, and we have an unfair advantage. Uh, because the unfair advantage is the product is not ours. It's a collaborative product from retailers and brands. They are forcing it now to become the new standard in retail. Um, and it answers all the needs that they had before. So it's, it's like, yeah, what, what, can, uh, what can you do? Oh yeah, and it's an international patent pending. An international patent pending means that you uh, have subscribed your uh, 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 patent to the Bureau. We already have the patents in Netherlands and Belgium, but now you want to have a worldwide cover. So the patent pending means that you have a worldwide cover, but it still has to go into a, um, yeah, how to explain this? to a phase that uh, um, after the patent pending it's um, approved, then you choose which countries you want to have the patent there. Uh, it's also expanding a little bit of the period because otherwise you have to cover all the world immediately and you will lose a lot of money in the beginning. We have uh, shots to the moon or shots to the Mars this is our mission. It's, uh, I, I really believe in mission-based marketing. If you have a mission, somebody co uh, also wants to believe in what you, uh, you're believing in. It's, it's the why. Uh, what we want to create is a new standard in the world in, in, in retail that is sustainable, smart, and we build it together. Uh, so we want to create a total uh, value chain transparency so we can see what's happened to our products we can see if it was at the right temperature, at the right time, et cetera. Uh, we want a fully automated value chain. Our product is ready for robotization, et cetera. So you can put it in a factory and go from factory to store. It's already uh, uh, there. And we believe they're in direct response to the market, uh, to, to, to the, the market's demand. So if you are in a store and something uh, happens that it, the weather is great, uh, uh, the next day, you should act on this uh, uh, in your store. 100% circular model. It has to be 100% circular. We reduce 85% of cardboard now, but we want to have 100%, uh, for example. CO2 neutral, you can go CO2 neutral if you have the right logistics, uh, but you, you, you need other uh, equipment there. You need electrical uh, vehicles, etc. And we don't want any waste anymore in the, uh, in the total value chain. And very important, build it together. If you start a startup, build it immediately <coughs> with customers, with people who believe in what you believe. Uh, and finally, they will say what product you need to develop. And if you have a great team, you will and can develop it and you already have your customers. And last but, last but not least, it always seems impossible until it's done. What we would like to do is help you to become a futurepreneur. Yeah, and we will, Kuhn and I will, uh, will, together with Sunrise Valley, in the afternoon, help you in the first phase of forming a team and, and really have the ambition to change something. Yeah, so not only have a product that is good for uh, uh, people, but also that has a great impact in a positive way in the world. Thank you. Please uh, do stay on stage and uh, we would like to ask the Kuhn as well to, to join. Um, so thank you for an uh, interesting presentation, uh, which as well some, some of the things, um, even though I worked in logistics um, and done some retail businesses before, um, that's new to me, so thank you for uh, brightening us up. So there is a very interesting um, um, and challenging question. Um, the anonymous author uh, from uh, uh, the guys here writes that since Lithuania is almost ahead of benevolence in terms of sustainability, which is a fun part. So, and the challenging part is what do you think uh, there is to learn in Lithuania for yourself? Do you find... What, what is what is to learn here in Lithuania for yourself? Is there anything you found that we do maybe better, faster, harder? The, the thing, and, and uh, uh, good, uh, must talk for uh, himself, but the thing that I 
uh, um, belief is really great here in, in, instead of the Netherlands, for example, is the eagerness of all the uh, people, especially the young people, is the eagerness to, to, to really create something. And, and the only thing there is that they can stand out more. Uh, so they, they ha must believe in themselves, that they really can change something, that they can change, uh, make an impact in this world. But the eagerness is there, and, uh, and, and that's really great. Would you like something to yeah, add? I can add on that that we are always, have we come in for a few years, that uh, the eagerness, but also they are really willing to share, to collaborate. In, uh, in Holland, we first have to start to change the mindset. Are you open to share and collaborate? But here it's already more from the start. And that's a great start uh, to work for your business. The other interesting and challenging question is, um, as well from, uh, uh, from Slido, is uh, what do you think about Elon Musk? Like, you know, we've become the celebrity of the green tech and uh, electrical autonomous vehicle and et cetera, et cetera. We, we, we follow, of course, uh, Elon, uh, Elon Musk. And, and the great thing always, I think, if you think you think big, <laughs> then Elon Musk think bigger. Yeah? So he wants to colonize Mars, for example. And I think that's a great ambition. Yeah? So uh, um, that's why we have uh, Mars or moonshots, or uh, we think of, okay, it has to be uh, uh, big. And the thing, the, the, the great thing is that he really believes that he can change the world th through business. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I like the way uh, uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, operates. And would you like something to add on? Yeah, it's always very inspiring that he thinks very disruptive, uh, come up with new ideas, but it's always well embedded in existing systems. Mm. Even the truck, he really thinks through it, how you can a really conservative logistic industry make a business, a disruptive business case in existing chains. And also with the congestion now he's doing, there's a lot of issue, congestion in cities. And it's, if you look to this new, that he made these tunnels in Los Angeles, with, uh, it's a, if you knew the construction building now, he, he's doing it for a cheaper price, getting a disruptive solution. So it's really in inspirational to, to see him. And what would you say to those in uh, stock exchanges um, and saying that, and investors who criticize him and saying, Look, this is just, you know, a PR stunt. Every time his company is losing the market value or on the share price is falling, he do a PR stunt and then they go up again. Would you think it's correlated to his inventions and presentation of those? I, I must say it's not my expertise, uh, this, uh, so all this uh, 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 stock ex uh, exchange. Um, but the thing that I uh, believe in is doing everything and everything differently. Uh, it's uh, that we start collaborating with our clients before we even create a product. That's doing something differently. And I think Elon Musk does also every everything differently and he's still out there. So uh, uh, maybe he fails, but he will have the impact. And maybe that's his greater goal instead of having this uh, uh, billion dollar uh, uh, industry I think the, the, the goal is greater than just the, uh, the enterprise. Yeah, what I think that behind the, uh, is a lot of skepticism. And we also notice that because we work a lot of global brands, but mostly it's, there are a lot of people, persons in these brands, they are want to make a change, but it doesn't mean like Coca-Cola wants to change because the general quiet is they are quite conservative. They invested a lot in the assets, so they are too reluctant for it. But if you work with indie brands, a lot of people want to make a change, and then you, if you develop the showcase, get the right momentum, things can change. But if, like this r overall reaction, people are, of course, uh, yeah, conservative thinking. And can be critical. Um, we have the time for one question from the audience. Yeah, lady there. Um, hello, thank you so much for your presentation. Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to underline that I believe in sustainability and it's our future. And, but I would like to ask you what do you think and what would be your sharpest answer to people, media, society who says that su sustainability is a trend and it will lose its value a bit like eco-friendly thing loss. And uh, 
relatable question also would be how would how do you communicate and how you think business companies should communicate with the society and make them believe that sustainability is not a tool, is not a trend, but it's a lifestyle and it will be necessary in our lives. So. <laughs> very, very good question, an interesting question. Um, how to convince people of becoming more sustainable? Uh, that's the main uh, uh, thing I, I, I get out of your, your, your question. Um, in the programs that we started, it's coming from within. It's the impact that you can create as a person. And we believe that it could, could be in business to business first, and the companies need needs to change from within. And they, they can work for big brands, but they can influence things. Uh, if you have a buying power, for example, if you purchase a product, but if you purchase a product from your uh, as a consumer, but if you purchase a product if you are in a company, then you have way more impact. Yeah? So for, from our uh, side, we convince those people who are having the power within the organizations to collaborate and to create collaborative impact. Uh, and, and so we, we are not really focusing on how to convince consumers, but how can we convince the people within companies to, to, to really change something. Add something, yeah. The it's not only the sustainable branding is lacking, but if you, it's the same. You have to make it convenient to the people, so that there are more qualities in life if you make it sustainable. Like this 24/7 energy, there is these countries they don't have 24 energy, and if you give a solution, they are they are help with it because they are using tablets, and mobile phones. So you have to bring it to convenient, and the same is if you work with companies. Some of them they have really efficient lean processes designed and with the mission from how will it be if you make it 100% sustainable then it open up the mind to see things and then they have become enthusiastic okay we can change our processes make it sustainable but also improve our processes so that you always have to make the win-win in thinking guys warm applause to our presenters for <laughs> great speech and uh, a small uh, gifts of appreciation you go the one for you and the one for you. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to thank you. You've been a great audience because you spend more time here than it's now supposed to be the coffee break. Uh, but before you leave, uh, I would like to uh, just conclude. It was, uh, it's, it's really you got the uh, great speeches. But, you know, I always, you know, done many, many conferences. Silicon Valley comes to the Baltic, um, Login Startup Fair and so, 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 so many of those. But I considered the conference good if I come up at least one idea I can take to myself and include in my business, my startup, or my daily life. So I hope that was a half a day invested well from your side into getting the ideas, into understanding the people who were presented, and be aware that in roughly 10 to 15 minutes, you have to be back here forming the teams and choosing your problems. And now, officially, thank you very much. Of first half a day, it's a coffee break. Thank you, and applause to yourself. You've been a great audience. Thank you.